All right, good afternoon or morning, um, wherever you are. We're gonna give a minute for more people to join. It looks like a whole bunch of people are entering uh, the webinar room right now. All right. Well, my name is Kathy Wiberly, and I am director of the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center, and we are um, doing a webinar on telehealth in a post-PHE world with Rebecca Canino. Um, just a little bit about us. Um, the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center is one of 14 telehealth resource centers federally funded by HRSA. We technically serve the dark purple states um, that you see on your screen right now, and we are um, a regional resource center that provides technical assistance and training for um, a set of states. So the dark purple states are ours, but we do serve the entire country as a national consortium of telehealth resource centers. So if you are not within our states, um, you can definitely find the resource center that serves you by going to telehealthresourcecenters.org. Um, this particular webinar is presented as a precursor to our leading transformation track for our upcoming telehealth summit. Um, the leading transformation track is intended to support and equip attendees with resources, tools, and skills to manage, lead, and accelerate digital transformation. And as you all probably know, and part of why you are probably joining this web webinar today is because we have been in this crazy two and a half year period where everything has been um, rapidly pivoting, oftentimes having a moving target that we can't keep track of or keep up with. And so part of this webinar is helping you to really understand what Rebecca has done um, with at Johns Hopkins in terms of how to lead change and transformation in this age where everything is a moving target. So I am going to flip to Rebecca. Thank you, Kathy. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Rebecca Canino. I am the executive director uh, for the Office of Telemedicine for Johns Hopkins Medicine. Um, hopefully you can see my screen right now. There we go. It's a miracle. I love how right, right before we do these presentations, that's when our technical challenges come. Um, a lot like what we're dealing with here at the end of the PHE, right? So much has happened and so much is changing and is changing every second of every day. So we're gonna talk about a lot. I'm gonna share a lot. None of this should be taken as legal advice. Okay, you're gonna have to do your own research. I have provided a million links on here. I will share this. I made all of the spreadsheets copyable so that you can um, have some tools, um, but please, uh, do not um, sue me, Rebecca Canino, uh, for any misleading information. I'm just doing this under the guise of being an expert. So here we go. Ready? Okay. I want to say ready, but it's not moving. Oh, there we go. Okay. So some key questions that we're going to talk about today. What is the PHE and how did, does it impact virtual care? What has Congress done to make telehealth flexibilities permanent? How long will these flexibilities last? And this is an ever-changing landscape. And what do we need to do to get ready for or be thinking about? Okay, uh, I did this uh, with Kathy, which is so exciting. And we did this for the National Center um, um, Teleresource Center, and you can go to that website and see this, and we're updating it at all times. Maybe, Kathy, you can send out that link to everybody so that they can have that. But here are some key dates. Um, the Omnibus, we had a early Christmas Eve Eve gift in the Omnibus and the Consolidated Appropriations Act, um, where telehealth flexibilities were extended for two years. Then in February, we got a notice that the PHE was going to end when? May 11th, uh, 2023. Now, when we get to September, do you remember the first um, 
151 day flexibility um, happened at the end of the Consolidated Appropriations Act in 2022. And that gave flexibility through the end of December 31st, 2023 for a lot of these things. And then the new appropriations flexibility, a new appropriations act came and put stuff out until December 31st, 2024. So this is where things start to get a little tricky, right? What is the impact? So in September 2023, the 151-day extension ends. So what are some of those impacts? And then January 2024, the new CMS calendar year 24 begins. Omnibus flexibilities keep going through until December 31st, 2023. And then in December 31st, 2024, at the end of that, January 1, that's when our calendar year uh, 25 CMS telehealth codes begin. So there is a lot going on. And so what's going to change when? So let's talk about some of the real um, nitty gritty what's going to happen. So look at this blue star with May 11th. This is what's going to happen in May. The DEA rules are going to change for how your providers can prescribe controlled substances. Qualifying providers are gonna change and audio only rates may change, okay? So rates, notice it's not audio only flexibilities, but just the rates. And these are some things that we're working on. The biggest thing that's going to change May 11th is that your HIPAA waiver ends, okay? That's when you're gonna to have to make sure that all your providers are on a HIPAA approved um, platform and that you have BAAs in place with those platforms. Super, super important. What's gonna end December 31st, 2023? Um, oh, I'm sorry, let's back up. What's gonna end September 2023 when your 151 day rules end? The biggest thing that's going to happen there is virtual supervision and the flexibilities around that. And so we're gonna have to keep a close, close eye on that. Then December 31st, 2023, your inpatient codes may expire. Who knows what's going to happen? We're going to be looking at that. Okay, where did I get all of this information? Okay, this is what I put together as our handy dandy grid of what's going to change when. So you have your pre-pandemic yellow column here, and this was our world before COVID before all the COVID-19 waivers came into play with the PHE. Here's our PHE, our first blue column. Now you'll notice on here, I have some Maryland information because Johns Hopkins is mainly in Maryland. Uh, you can disregard that if you are not in Maryland, but this is what came out of the PHE. Medicare, Medicaid would cover video visits no matter where the patient was located. So that means the geographical locations went away. Uh, the geographical restriction. So it was no longer rural versus non-rural. We could see them anywhere. Home was a covered site. This was our biggest change, right? It's important to remember as we talk about all these flexibilities that commercial payers have covered telemedicine broadly and without restrictions. That did not change through PHE, nor is it affected by PHE, okay? So it's important when you look at your payer mix to know your impact. And we're gonna talk about this a little uh, further on, but commercial payers are covering. Okay, with the public health emergency, audio only was covered at parity, okay? And so this is happening right here and at parity at a visit level parity, okay? Not just at telephone code reimbursement, but at visit level ENM parity for reimbursement levels, really important point. Provider type, multiple roles were allowed, including most of our allied health professionals, super important, social work, uh, audiologists, SLP, uh, dietitians, right? All of these folks could now provide telemedicine. Virtual supervision, now we had virtual supervision and general supervision was allowed for RPM and RTM. Expanded inpatient codes came out. All of you are familiar with this because this is the world we are living in now. And platforms, uh, HIPAA compliance was not enforced. Okay, here's our red line of the PHE expires, May 11, 2023. In the 151-day 
transition, you'll notice most of these keep going across, no changes, okay? Going all the way down, except for your HIPAA compliant platforms, okay? Those are BAA. Now you need a HIPAA compliant platform with a BAA. Now, once that 151 day transition ends in September, now we have the omnibus bill, otherwise known as the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2023. And these take some of these all the way over until December 31st, 2024. Now we've got some questions in here for our audio only. Audio only is allowed. The payment parity, what was not given in the omnibus bill was how we're going to do this. What codes are we billing CMS? Are we going to be billing the visit level like we have been doing with a telephone modifier? How are we doing this? What are the exact uh, reimbur reimbursement mechanisms, right? That is missing. So that is a question. Also not addressed are virtual supervision and your expanded inpatient codes. And so these, we still need to be keeping an eye out on. Now, how can we be tracking these and what can we be looking at, right? This is a full-time job. So what I've done, uh, the next set of six, seven slides are going to be some websites that have done a fabulous job of tracking and where you can go for information. So Alliance for Connected Care, I think it's one of the best ones out there. They've got this great tracker that's telling us when things are gonna end giving us that sense of urgency, uh, really helpful to use this as we're moving forward. But they have put out some notes and actually tracked out. So I put this on there for you to look at, actually tracked out what's changing, what's linked to the Consolidated Appropriations Act, what's tied to the PHE. So this is something that you can go through and really get some nitty gritty information about, okay? We are not going to go through each one of these because it is um, a little intense, but it is all here. And as we um, go into our question and answers, we'll probably go back to these slides to answer some of those questions, okay? So some of these they have tied to the PHE, some of them they have moving on. The next article that's come out that's been really helpful, and I don't know how many of our listeners are fee-for-service telemedicine versus health systems, which of you are running your own business, uh, Foley took the viewpoint of if you own a telehealth business, these are some things you're going to need to know. So they came at it from a different viewpoint, and this may be more helpful for you depending on how you are set up and what view, what lens you're looking through, okay? So they list all the same things um, that are listed on the Allied um, Alliance for Connected Health, but they look at it a little differently. Now for, let me go back, for the Alliance for Connected Care, I did not pull everything off of the site. I just pulled things specific to telemedicine. There are a multitude of other things that you may find interesting, so please go on that site. Okay, they list on things fully on like patients with high deductible health plans can utilize first dollar coverage, uh, which isn't brought up in Allied. There's some other things on here, uh, RPM copayment waivers, um, that I didn't copy and put on there. So again, uh, really interesting to look at. There's also some live links on here. This is probably the number one thing that everyone's looking at is controlled substances and what our providers are going to be able to prescribe and if they're going to need patients, need to see patients in person before they can do that and the effects of that. So you'll hear a lot about that in the news. And this is like the hottest topic right now because this is the pain point that people see coming up on May 11th. Uh, direct supervision going all the way through to um, December 31st. You will see that they and I have some different views than Alliance for Connected Health. You're gonna see people have some different views. That's why you can take none of this as, um, as gospel, please do your research and reach out to your legal groups. 
This is another great bulletin that was pull, uh, put out by the AHA, American Hospital Association, and they did it by date and they picked up some um, additional things. So if you are a health system and you're looking at this and your telemedicine goes beyond ambulatory and inpatient, they brought up uh, skilled nursing facility beds. Uh, they brought up EMTALA for your emergency departments. They brought up your critical access hospitals, the flexibility on how many beds and how many hours. These are all things that you're gonna to have to be thinking about depending on what hat you wear, okay? So I just wanted to make sure that I had some resources on here, no matter what you're looking at. So they have some PHE provisions ending December 31st. This was an interesting one. Liability immunity for countermeasures for COVID-19 will end October first, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, I've seen other people bring up PrEP. You'll see that on the Alliance, but not so telemedicine focused. So I just have it on there um, as a heads up. So again, they have the flexibilities going through December 31st to 2024 waiver, right? You can do this anywhere. It reimburses for extended uh, provider types. You can do it for FQHCs and RHCs. You can use it for hospice, um, in-person for um, a requirement for telebehavioral health pushed to 2024, acute hospital program. So all this good stuff. Okay, let's stop and take a deep breath. This is so much to do. Right, and so our panic levels rise. What do I do first? Who do I pull together? So you're not in it alone. You are going to have to reach out in your organization and really pull together a SWAT team. So these are some of the members of our SWAT team. Uh, this is what we have. We have a handy dandy plan document that we use um, when a state waiver is expiring, when a certain flexibility is um, expiring when something, uh, even within our own state coverage, um, is expiring. This is our document that we use. Who's tracking it? Who alerts who? Once you're alerted, what do you do? What triggers that alert? Who's responsible? And so I took one of ours and I stripped off the responsible person and back up just to give you a picture of what this could look, look like. So let's look at our uh, responsible group first. So we have our government affairs team, our legal group, OOT, which is the Office of Telemedicine, which is me. Um, we have our CPA group. Um, we have our media and communications group. We have all of our EPIC team. So I'm coming at this from an EPIC shop. If you are Cerner, you're going to want to pull those groups. No matter what your EMR is, you are going to want those builders and the people that actually make changes in EMR to be on your team, right? So if your billing is not done within your EMR, you're going to need your separate third-party billing group to be involved in this as well, okay? All of ours are housed within our EMR, which is EPIC, and so you're going to see some EPIC terms here. Our MyChart team, our Access team, our Billing team, our Profi Billing team, our Facility or Hospital Billing team, your operations leadership. So who's the head of all your different operations group? You're gonna need your clinic and your practice managers. And then this stuff is gonna to start to filter down. I don't have a list of all the practice managers, but the operations leadership does, right? I don't have a list of all of our clinic staff, but the practice managers do. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you filter your plan to go all the way from the top, to go down, 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 to get to the individual who needs that information, okay? So you've assembled your team, here's your team, and you've assembled your plan. So this is what we have to do uh, to get a change to go all the way down to the person scheduling the visit or to the patient having the visit, right? And so what reports do you have to run in what systems, what analysis has to be done, do you have those reports set up so that you can just filter, set in your dates and get the information you need? Do some practice runs, right? Get everyone together. Okay, 
So we've got our SWAT team who we think we need to bring on. How do we onboard them, right? It is, if you go at them with that list, their eyes go like this. They're like a deer in the headlights, right? They're like, oh my God, this is too much. What do I really need to start looking at? And this was actually a lesson learned with us. Okay, we started going to these groups with, this is what we think you'll have to do. And we got panic in response and freezing. And so we have changed our approach to this and we call it buckets of fun. And we go to our groups and we say, okay, legal, this is what we're gonna need from you for the next two and a half years. We're gonna need guidance requiring licensure, risk, contracts, privacy, expanded services, and the ever evolving requirements around the provisioning of telehealth. And they go, okay, in order to do that, you're gonna need so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. How often do you think these are gonna be changing? Okay, here's the cadence of your meetings. And then you're gonna get with that work group and make your plan. For media and communications, we said, we're gonna need ongoing communications to providers and patients regarding shifting legislation and requirements around telemedicine. Media and communication said, okay, we think we are gonna need our social media folks. We're gonna need our internal communications. We are going to need, up oh, legislation. Are you going to want to use some stories and some um, real life examples to influence legislation? Yes, we are. Okay, let's bring in that team. Okay, you want to talk directly to providers? Let's bring in that team. Okay, uh, how often do you need to do this? For us, it's every two weeks that we need to talk about this. Okay, so we set the cadence of our meetings, who's supposed to be there, then we set our plans. Government affairs. Now, depending on how you're set up, are you in one state? Are you in multiple states? Okay. You're going to want to um, have multiple government affairs teams. So we have a government affairs team for Maryland. Um, and then we have one for Maryland, DC, Virginia, right? The, the kind of regional group and Florida for where we all are. And then we have our national government affairs team. Now Hopkins is huge. I do not expect that most um, organizations are going to have, are going to be blessed with this many folks at their disposal, but you're gonna wanna reach out and figure out who you have. This is what we told them. We need the creation support and passage of legislation to facilitate licensure portability, federal payer flexibility and telehealth state regulations. Right. So not only do we want to lobby and get the change that we want to see, but we need to know what's coming down the pipeline. Maryland is just in their um, legislative session here in Annapolis, and every day new bills are coming up on the docket, and we need to decide, are we supporting them? Are we putting in a letter? Are we doing this? What do we need to do? So you're kind of managing what you need to do now and forecasting what you're going to need to do later. So depending on what arena you're in is how much you need your government affairs um, folks involved. We meet with our nat national, just as an example, we, we meet with our national folks quarterly. We meet with our state folks um, every two weeks and we meet regionally monthly. Okay, so that's kind of how we do it. It depends on what's changing and shifting in your area. For your operations group, this is so, so important that you have the heads of your operation group. We have the heads um, in our group of our ambulatory sites. So it's not per site, it's per, like uh, for Johns Hopkins Hospital, all of the outpatient associated with that. For Bayview, all of the associated um ambulatory operations. Then you have your inpatient operations, and that's typically by hospital. If you're lucky, maybe you have one that's overall, but you're going to need to get them together, keep them on board so that they're in the loop. The most important thing when you're working with your operations group is getting in front of panic and people making changes. So if folks here, the PHE is ending, we can't do telemedicine anymore. This is what comes to their mind. I'm gonna to have to shift my telemedicine to in-person and have my scheduler stop scheduling telemedicine visits. You wanna get in front of that decision that can be made, right? 
A scheduler could make that decision and start steering people different ways. A clinic manager could start making that decision. A provider could start making that decision, right? So you need to get ahead of that and make sure that communication is getting to them. So part of this, and this is how we came, because we already had that in place, when we went to our operations folks, we said, we're gonna be counting on you for planning for the continued and increased use of telemedicine services from budgeting to staffing while communicating all of these ongoing changes. So when you look at an administrator level operations person, they are actually putting in the budget for telemedicine visits, right? You need to make sure that they're looking at the year ahead, forecasting accurately. It's going to stay the same or increase. We have a two-year right ramp here that we should continue to ramp up. So baseline is maintaining what we have here at Hopkins, where about 15% of our ambulatory services are by telemedicine. And we want to increase that both in the ambulatory and in the inpatient. And so it's very, very important that you get in front of your folks making those decisions and budgeting for them. They need to know what's happening and they need to be um, sending that information downward. Okay, what are some of the other buckets of fun? Here's our other groups. So our access group, they are in charge of the scheduling mechanisms that, it, that are behind our EMR. This is hugely important. The more you can automate telemedicine into your scheduling, the more you can keep what you're doing and grow it, right? And so we said to our access, we really need to make sure that direct scheduling and decision tree logic, this is how we schedule on the back end. I'm using some epic words, so forgive me if you are not epic. Um, creation allows for rules, ever shifting rules around state licensure, role, payer, patient location, et cetera, because we are looking ahead and saying what legislation could come down, right? What if the geographical goes away? We're going to need patient location. What if it's based on diagnosis, like rules about having an in-person visit before a telemedicine visit for behavioral health while that has been pushed off? What happens when that comes? What are we going to need? We're going to need now to know by diagnosis, right? And so We've asked them, look down, start looking in your crystal ball, start working with um, the EMR folks to make sure that we're going to have a way to be able to schedule patients looking at all these things, okay? And these things are changing all the time. We put our requirements right at the top of our decision tree logic so that it is invisible to the scheduler and to the patient scheduling, but depending on what state they put in, or what kind of visit or things like this, it starts changing the logic to point them over to a video visit or an in-person visit. Really, really important stuff. Okay, another group that you're gonna have to pull in is whoever does your credentialing and licensing. And for us, that is our medical staffing office, our MSO. You're gonna have to start looking at, this is what we said to them, licensure and compact management for both credentialed and non-credentialed providers. This is a huge shift. Typically, your medical staffing office is only looking at your credentialed providers, which is your MDs, your DOs, your PAs, right? Folks that can um, order in the system, right? They need to be credentialed at certain hospitals in order to do that. They need to be licensed, right? With a medical license in order to do that. They are the ones that your medical staffing office is following, putting in their systems, whatever that middleware is, that's flowing over into your EMR so that you can have the provider's licensure field in there. That allows your direct scheduling for your access group right? And for your decision tree. So without having those in your EMR, you will not be able to filter your scheduling based on licensure. And you won't be able to have that, that guardrail in your system. And so we've asked our MSO office, start looking at credentialed and non-credentialed, right? Because now we have speech therapists, OT, PT, dietitians, um, psychologists, all of these folks are managed in different systems in your health system, but they need to somehow get into your EMR so you can track it. Added to this complexity, because hell, this isn't complex enough, is 
compacts and all the different types of compacts. We should do a whole nother webinar on compacts, but you have things like SIPAC, which is true reciprocity for psychologists. If you are licensed as a psychologist in one state, 33 states in the SIPAC agreement will allow you to do telepsychology in those states based on that um, license, right? That's true reciprocity. Then you have the IMLC, Interstate Medical Licensing for Providers, that says, if you have licensure in this state, you can apply for licensure in these other states. They can grant you full licensure based off of the paperwork on this, but it is a license in each state, right? And so that is not reciprocity. That is licensure. Then you have things like the state of Florida who says, uh, register on this website and based on you having a license in good standing in your state, you can see our patients here in Florida, right? It's not role-based. You just have to register and, and, and credential the non-credential providers can, can practice in Florida based on that registration. Very, very complex. Make best friends with your medical staffing office or office and really have someone in your institution that is an expert or check all of these other websites that I've given you um, for some guidance. Okay, next group to have on your SWAT team is your pro fee billing. I'm just checking the time. I want to make sure we leave lots of time for questions. Um, we asked them, we need to be able to reverse flexibility logic as needed, creation of a possible modifier for patient location and behavioral health diagnosis in case things don't change in a year and a half, billing logic for upstand, updated standards by CPT code. So make sure we've got the logic lined out by CPT code so that we can go in and turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, make those changes and have training for your group for your groups that are doing the coding on the back end, your auditing, that are working the work queues for billing, make sure that's all in place. Very, very important. And we're gonna talk more about billing because this is just the tip of the iceberg. Hospital billing, HB as we call it over here. We ask them, we need to make sure that you're gonna be able to navigate the evolving requirements of our local, Maryland is very special, HSCRC, and the expanding roles that are providing telemedicine. Okay, so that's national. Now we have these expanding roads, roles, they're gonna be able to bill. How are they gonna be billing? What is the mechanism? Do we have to have our PT and OT folks leased over to the university in order to build these codes? Are we gonna have them build direct does that mean they need to be enrolled with all of these payers, right? These are all the questions when you start looking at what was typically only hospital, only moving into telemedicine and operating in both ambulatory and inpatient arenas. Hey, okay? lots of questions about this. And then thank God for our compliance departments that keep us in the light and moving um, safely. And so we ask them, we're gonna need your guidance or regarding supervision, there's all sorts of stuff. When you start looking at supervision and start really going into it, go on the Alliance for Connected Care Supervision and click on their billing guidance and billing. Um, I took screenshots of it, but those aren't active links because it's super important. You've got primary care exceptions under general, su under supervision. You've got um, supervision for rehab sites and what they can and can't do. You have supervision for virtual supervision for virtual visits, right? Some things are still unclear, but you're going to need compliance to really guide you through this. So uh, we also wanted guidance around inpatient use cases as things changed and new documentation requirements that are coming out every year, right? With our calendar year CMS um, guidance. And so we really need them to be with us. And then we said to them, what haven't we thought of? So I just put this here so that you can use it uh, with your own groups. Okay. When you talk about billing, so much to look at here. Okay. So you just have to take a real deep breath. You've assembled your team. 
first thing you're going to want to do is take a code and billing inventory. So I took a snapshot of ours. This is from our FY22. So it's not even up to date. Do not use any of this information. I'm just showing you how to do it. So what you're going to want to have is your CPT codes, your description. We always track the work RVUs. This is, we I think have six or seven RVU columns for facility, non-facility, malpractice. I just put this down to one. Then you have your rate location, okay? This is really important when you're working with your reimbursement folks and business planning and really quantifying the impact of some of these codes changing is you're gonna wanna know what the Medicare rate is for this and it would change. So for us, Baltimore City has a rate, Baltimore County has a rate, DC has a rate, Virginia has a rate, Florida has a rate, right? And so, um, our columns go across with all of those rates. And then you plug in what this year's rate is for you uh, to get all of that. Then you have your CPT code, um, which I don't know why that's duplicated. And then what you're gonna wanna do is say, do we use this in the inpatient arena, the outpatient arena or both? Okay, and you're gonna wanna track that. Do we bill PB or HB for this? Track that. Are we billing? Yes, no for this code. We've done this for every code in the CBT book. Okay, crazy pants. What programs are using these codes most, right? So when we have to make changes, who do we go back to? Where is this code found in the CBT book? Is it Appendix P? Is it under virtual codes? Is it under some expanded codes, right? Notes, what modifiers need to be used, what related JIRAs. Now, I have this in here just so you can start tracking this. JIRA is what we call when we put in a request to change something. It's also called a Murdoch, a Sherlock, depending on how your organization does it. You're going to want to put those in here so that you can click back on them, figure out how you built it, figure out what needs to be changed, right? So you're going to want to tie some of your systems together. This is how we do it. And then is it tied to the PHE? Yes or no. We have other columns for 151 days, omnibus, right? And it goes out. But I really wanted to give you kind of a framework to use to how to do it. So once you've done your inventory and you know where everything is, if you're billing, where it is, then you're going to have to determine what's going to change, right? That's where that related JIRA is so important. And then you're going to have to prioritize those changes and tackle it, okay? That's when it gets down to the nitty gritty. Planning. You're going to want to take it step by step. I took a screenshot of our um, 2022 end of PHE Gantt chart just to show you uh, what it could look like. Here's all the things like send announcements, do this, do this. You can tell this is old because it's got old dates in it. Who do we send to? What's a distant site? What do we have to do? Here's our CPT codes, right? None of this is updated, so it's all looking like it's overdue. But this is how you're going to want to set it up, especially because if you look over in the schedule and progress um, areas, you're going to want to be able to change those dates. The dates that we had on there are no longer applicable, right? Because things are changing. So if you start listing out your work plan in something like a Gantt chart, you would be able to shift those and uh, change those things and your priorities and start moving it up. Okay, I have talked a lot and not even taken a breath. I'm gonna take a sip of coffee and we're gonna open it up. Kathy? You're on mute. I am. Um, so we do have one question in the chat box. It yes. says, we are a health system. It appears hospital without walls initiative will expire with the PHE 511-23. This means that we would not be able to continue to offer outpatient hospital-based services via telehealth after the PHE, even though PT, OT, SLP are still considered eligible telehealth providers through 24 per CCA 2023. Any thoughts on if hospitals will continue to have the ability to bill for these outpatient hospital-based services via telehealth after 511? <sighs> this is a question that we are grappling with now. 
Okay, so it depends on how you set up your program. So acute care hospital at home is going through December 31st, 2024. Okay, so if your program got set up under that, then you can do some things. Like a lot of people set up hospital at home underneath that. For hospital without walls, we are in the same boat you are trying to figure it out. And I'm so sorry, I have no additional wisdom to share. Yeah, I think that there is so much of this um, end of PHE stuff where there are probably more gray areas than there are answers, unfortunately. Yep. Um, but we are trying to keep get a handle on as much of it as we can for you. And as we get more information, um, a lot of this, we will definitely disseminate. So we have a question that says, Rebecca, when you say we, do you mean your telemedicine team or Johns Hopkins? Um, so when I say we in doing the work, that is my telemedicine team. I do very little of this work. I have an amazing team. I think there's a few of them on right now, but they are incredible. Um, and also when I say we, I'm talking about the SWAT team. Um, I am not using we as Hopkins for anything legally liable here. <laughs> good answer. All right. Courtney made a statement that says, thank you, good to be among friends. And I think this is what this is all about. It's really mm -hmm. building a community where we are working on this together because there, there are just way too many gray areas for any of us to have the full answers for. So we have. Um, not a question, but your blueprint for who to succinctly pull together to discuss how to navigate post-PHE is amazing. So thank you for sharing. Good. I'm glad it's useful. What are, I don't know, in this format, if if folks can chime in or raise hands, or I don't, I don't know what's possible, but is this resonating with folks? Am I stating the obvious? I don't know if folks want to chime in. It's a little hard for me because I have so many resources at my disposal, right? And so when we talk to smaller health systems or hospitals or uh, private physicians groups, um, this is why it's so important to share those national resources that are available. And what I don't have on here is your local TRC, right? As a just so many resources on there. So you're going to want to um, call a friend, right? Reach out um, and um, make use of all the resources um, that are available as we go through this. And thank you, uh, Courtney, for that other comment. The more we hear about this, the more it sinks in and it's always nice to hear others' experiences. And I, that is like spot on, I think we are in this boat together and figuring it out together. And it is very nice to have a community that can do this together. So that's part of what we're trying to develop. And if you are in our matrix footprint, we actually have started creating a number of um, state-based groups that are trying to come together and share information. And so I know most of you are in a state where there's also state changes to navigate. Um, and those are changing fast and furious as well. And I know like I'm here in Virginia and we have legislation out the wazoo right now. <laughs> that it's amazing what's coming out of Virginia. Yes. <laughs> I'm so, so heartened. Go Virginia. Um, but it, yeah. it is a crazy time. Yeah. Yep. And I think it's important to realize um, the state that you're in, Medicaid can decide to expand. Right, so here in Maryland, um, the Preserve Telehealth Act was passed, um, allowing, and they actually codified it, that Medicaid patients can receive telemedicine in the home. So regardless of what flexibilities end with Medicare, Medicaid can extend coverage, okay? So they can't limit it, but they can extend it. And so you're going to wanna work with your state um, to have them, adopt things that are allowable, like CMS just put out a letter to the state saying that states are allowed to add e-consult coverage um, to, to their coverage, right? And they're encouraging them to add it. And so be aware of those things as they can amplify that, 
and really work with your state to expand that coverage. Another thing that they um, Preserve Telehealth Act um, put in was audio only coverage at Parity, which is just a beautiful thing, right? And so uh, getting some of that, using this time to expand your state coverage um, can have a huge impact going forward. Absolutely. We do have one question. So in the advocacy efforts for ongoing telehealth services, I wonder if language access concerns are being raised up. For example, in our program, we have not yet figured out how to confidentially and smoothly include a language interpreter into a video visit, while we are easily able to do so in audio only visits, providing all kinds of telehealth helps LDP clients in so many ways. Yes. So equity is huge. And as we look at telemedicine, um, equity is at the forefront here at Hopkins. It is at the forefront for me personally. Um, And so when you start looking and take the opportunity for the HIPAA waiver going away to push your organization to go onto a HIPAA um, compliant platform, most of those have the capability to build in that language interpreter integration. Okay, and so use that as a jumping and a leverage point uh, to get your institution to um, invest in in um, in language interpreter services. They all are required to have it. It's the problem is it's just siloed, right? And so a lot of folks used COVID dollars, which was awesome, to integrate those. Uh, but if your institution didn't leverage this next requirement coming down the pike for the HIPAA platform, because it's so important that on demand, we can um, be able to communicate with our patients. Absolutely. I think we can try to leverage all this rapidly changing environment for a lot of things. So I think, you know, using this opportunity to make some changes that may or may not have to do completely with the PHE, but it has to do with the complete fluctuation of all the policies. And, you know, when there is great chaos, it's actually a really good opportunity to make changes for other things that you want to make changes for. Yeah, like don't waste a good emergency. Like this is, (laughs) this, uh, the boom of telehealth and now the normalization of telehealth. That's really what we're in, right? These next two years are going to be how we normalize. I am confident that Congress will make some of these changes permanent, right? They're just giving themselves a, selves a bridge to making those things permanent. I believe that the geographic restrictions are going to go away, that home will be an approved site. Virtual supervision, guys, if you're in a research, if you're in an academic setting, get stuff out there, publish. Let's show how this enriches education, prepares our learners for this new world, right? And that it it expands access and lets people receive care better. If supervision can be done remotely, then that person doing the actual care, their reach is broadened, okay? And so, and that has direct patient impact. So we need to amplify things that are, that have direct negative impact on patients like DEA, right? If we can't get ADHD medications out there, what is that going to do for our students, for our working population, for, for humanity as a whole? What are we doing for, you know, for any of those controlled substances? And there is a whole rainbow of substances that we need to be able to get to people. That in-person requirement for behavioral health, what does that impact look like? We need to be publishing and showing what the backlog would be and how access would be slammed shut um, if these things aren't made permanent. Absolutely. We have a great comment from Haley, which is, I think you are addressing a lot of things that we are all thinking about in the back of our minds and are required to do. Standing at the bottom of the mountain preparing to climb is intimidating, and it absolutely is. Um, I have like, I think I have never encountered a time in these last three years where policies have shifted sometimes in a weekly basis um, and trying to stay on top of it and, and be on that and then trying to like help people strategically plan to move forward when you know that the target is still moving. Um, right? So <laughs> it's, it's, it's ever shifting. And there's almost like, if you haven't done any work, you're okay. 
<laughs> and this is this because things are changing so quickly that really you have to make sure people are ready to work when it's time. And your job is to think of the possibilities and list them out, right? Because if we get people working ahead of time and did it on getting way into the details, and then it changes, right? We lose their engagement. And so this is almost like you're getting everybody on alert. You're running some drills, like look at it, preparedness. And then to the best of your ability, you're laying out what's going to change when, so you know what to tackle but you're not pulling the trigger. Everybody's ready, right? But you're not pulling the trigger and you're just really focusing the bulk of your attention on the things that are most critical now, right? Those most critical things. Hospital without walls, what the heck is happening, right? This is gonna impact actual programs. We, we need to get our arms around that. Getting on a HIPAA compliant platform. You need to do that now, right? If you're gonna be signing contracts or doing anything like that, if you haven't started, you need to jump on it because you've got to be live on that by May 11th. And we all know how long it does it takes to do a contract, right? And so you're really working on that. And then you have to keep a portion of your mind on the legislative lobbying, turf that off, make experts among your team so that people are working on those things concurrently, but really take a deep breath and work on what you have to work on now. Really, really important. There was a question uh, in the Q&A about contracts and simplifying yep. them. I wish to God I could. Okay. We do have templated contracts that have made things much easier. Those things are changing on those. So we have to update those. We update them about once every three months that we're finding changes come along. Things like cyber insurance, right? Places don't have a lot of knowledge about that. And how do you talk to them? Um, we do have different types of contracts for health departments versus SNFs versus private practice, right? Three different templates. And so um, having those templated, having knowing who the lawyer is, is really important. And we have found if we can get the lawyers to just talk to each other and hash it out versus sending it back and redlining between the operational folks, much, much faster. So those are my pearls of wisdom around your um, agreements. Yeah, contracting is a pain and with all the changing navigation pieces, um, it makes it even more. And I definitely concur with Rebecca. If you can get the lawyers to just talk on the phone or by video with each other, it's a whole lot better than redlining, you know, change this word from happy to glad. And, you know, it's like, why, why are we making this change? This is ridiculous. It's crazy. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you can get the lawyers and then that way they can, you know, be pulling up statutes and, and talking lawyerly talk, but it'll get done. And that's really, that's really, um, what you need to do. We have found that contracting takes longer than the actual operationalizing, setting up the technology, doing the training, did like, and then we're waiting on contracts. Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you, Rebecca, for sharing. Um, I saw a comment from Harshal that we struggled the language translation earlier, but we have worked with our vendor to figure out how to integrate video into our epic process. We're talking, yeah. we're taking a more phased approach. I'm happy to talk about it if needed. And I think that really is like, that's what this is all about, right? We're all sharing the things, the lessons learned. And so I'm just gonna flip real quick to end with a plug for our summit. This, this is what we're all about. We are trying to share our lessons learned and best practices with each other. Um, it's coming up March in Nor Norfolk, Virginia. So if you are anywhere near, but we are also offering hybrid, I think over 80% of folks are coming in person this year, which I'm very excited about. Um, we have some great keynotes and plenary sessions, but I did wanna just highlight that we, started our leading transformation track last year because of this constant change. And the leading transformation track is really all about equipping leaders like yourselves um, to deal with this constant chaos. Um, and so some of the sessions we have are like innovator die, yikes, but I don't have the time, building cultures of innovation, leading through crisis, using improvisation to transform team culture, um, achieving transformation through strategy-driven execution, but we also have a creating communities of innovation practice. And that's what this is conversation is about. Like how do we as a group come together and learn from each other? And so one of our final sessions is going to be that. And we are setting aside a whole, um, 
for the first 20 organizations who sign up, um, the person who's leading the creating communities of innovation is actually going to run a four post summit webinar series for any for the first 20 organizations that come up. And they're really going to run your team. So sign up as a team and they're going to do deciding what problem to solve. Innovation is best practices uh, practiced as a team sport. Iterative prototyping and evidence-based storytelling. It's really kind of the how do you get from, you know, this is where we hope to go and how do we get there? So we definitely encourage you to be part of that. And, um, and if you want more information or to register for our summit, it's matrcsummit.org. And we hope to see you in Norfolk. Thank you for joining us. And we will be making everything available on the National Consortium website under our um, end of the PhD collection. And that will be going out to you by um, notification after this as well. So you'll have the link. Thank you all. Thanks all.